busy in the lunch area. With the time, we have, it's already time. Let's start the session. I would like to invite Dr. Bharani Kumar Reddy to speak on medical management of glaucoma. Good afternoon, everyone. I was given a very uh, tough topic, a <laughs> wide topic in the sense so that I have to cover everything in a very short time. That the topic is medical management of a glaucoma. Slides are not moving. Uh, once glaucoma is suspected, then confirmed and one, fitted into one of the subgroups, and if you decide that the treatment has to be started to prevent progression of a disease, probably the medical treatment is the uh, one option, probably the first option, especially in the Indian scenario. But in Western countries, the options are changing. And uh, to prevent glaucoma-related damage, the most viable option is to decrease and stabilize IOP. And we have to treat the systemic conditions that compromise the blood supply to the optic disc. Factors that must be considered before initiating treatment is the stage of the disease, the effectiveness and the problems caused by our treatment and also the socio-economic factors. These are the anti-glaucoma medications in our uh, armamentarium. All of us are quite aware of it. These two uh, RHO kinase inhibitors are the recent addition to it. And some of the practical points as far as these medicines are concerned is beta blockers, they should be avoided apart from asthma and bradycardia, which already we know. They have to be avoided even in normal tension glaucoma mm -hmm. as well as in neonates and especially if the patients are already on systemic beta blockers. Prostaglandins, they have to be avoided in inflammatory glaucomas and especially in unilateral glaucoma. Brimoridin, we have to avoid in extremes of age as they can cause a delirium or a, in adults, in the elderly people and apnea in children. And these are the various modes of delivery of drugs right from topical solutions which are very old, still the most popular method to the recent uh, ring inserts and also the anterior chamber implants as far as biometoprost is concerned. And once we, if, sometimes if we have, if we encounter a very high pressure situations, especially above 40 or 50, first of all we have to bring down the pressure to the levels of 25 by using systemic medications. Then only the topical medications will be effective. And especially if you are starting the case for the first time, we have to do a diurnal variation if it is feasible, especially if this is possible in a medical college setup at these timings. The idea being to note the peak IOP, the IOP fluctuation, as well as the timing of the IOP spike. The peak IOP, the importance of peak IOP is it is from this level that our target IOP will be decided. And we have to record the baseline IOP as well as the baseline visual fields also on the file for a subsequent follow-up. We all know the, that the target IOP has to be set in. The, we all know the definition of target IOP. These are the factors on which our target IOP will depend on, the stage of glaucoma, the rate of progression during our follow-up, and also the risk factors, most important. And target, as a general rule, the tar, as far as the target IOP is concerned, in any established case of glaucoma, especially in the mild disease, the IOP always has to be kept below 18 millimeters, and the peak has to be less than and uh, between the, the fluctuation should not be more than 3 millimeters. That is also most important. Usually, generally, the visual fields will not progress, especially in advanced cases, if the IOP is maintained around 12 or less than 12. Let us take three scenarios. One is a mild disease wherein there are disc changes but no field defects. Our aim is to keep the target IOP 20% reduction from the baseline, at least 18 millimeters. The moderate disease, wherein disc changes but field changes are confined to one hemifield only, our aim is to reduce the pressure by 30 percent, set around 15 millimeters so that the disease will not progress. And in a very severe disease, wherein you will see the field effects on both hemifields and it has involved the central five degrees also, our aim is to reduce the pressure by 50 percent and better to set it around 12 millimeters. And but if you are starting the case for the first time, especially, we have to take the, these factors, especially while selecting the medication. It depends on the systemic comorbidities, the cost, the lifestyle of the individual, and the amount of pressure which we want to reduce. For example, if you want a less, less pressure reduction around between 2 to 3.5 millimeters, choose betaxolol or bimodin or repositin. If you want moderate pressure reduction by between 3 to 5 millimeters, choose carbonic anhydrase inhibitors or timolol or netarsidin. More pressure, more than 5 millimeters, choose prostaglandins. 
prostaglandins are choice for the glaucoma specialist being they will take care of the nocturnal spikes also especially which is very difficult to measure especially during our routine practice the if one drug which have selected is not working we can go for other drugs so many drugs are available how to initiate the therapy is we have to select a drug which will have a potency to at least 20 percent efficacy to decrease the pressure probably prostaglandin or beta blocker and we have to continue the drug for a period of uh, four to six weeks before deciding the to change the drug or to continue the drug especially the best is to take a preservative free medication so that we can avoid the future damage after four to six weeks if possible we have to do a diurnal control also to idea is the check the iop reduction as well as the fluctuation also is most important which we have to end at the end of four to six weeks if the primary drug is uh, acting and it has achieved the target iop continue the drug no problem whereas if the drug fails to achieve at least 20 percent reduction or the initial drug has resulted in a, some sort of a side effects then switch to another drug Whereas if the primary drug has achieved 20% reduction but not achieved the target IOP, you can add the other drug. Suppose one advantage of prostaglandins is intraclass which is possible, which is not possible with other group of drugs. For example, we have to be aware of this so-called washout phenomenon. That means the initial drug continues to act for a certain period of time even after starting, stopping the treatment. That is uh, uh, for three days for pilocarbon, six weeks for beta blockers. These are the rules for combination therapy. And follow-up is, once the IOP is uh, uh, achieved, target IOP achieved, it's sustained for three to four months with no further field loss. Follow-up for one to two years at three to four monthly intervals, and then at six monthly intervals. Uh, we have to advise them not to drink large quantity of water, especially in the advanced cases. We have to, simultaneously, we have to monitor the systemic conditions also. Blood pressure should always be maintained as per age. Don't allow hypotension to develop. If two drugs are not acting, we can add uh, other drugs. Nowadays, even four drugs are being tried, especially if the patient is not fit for surgery. A word about neuroprotection is, as now we know, the definition of glaucoma is uh, uh, neurodegenerative disease. The death is, uh, this death is ca being caused by apoptosis. We can try these neuroprotective agents. And word about normal tension glaucoma is, this is more common in people with primary vascular dysregulation syndrome. We have to manage this condition. Avoid beta blockers. We can try any other drugs, but don't use beta blockers. And uh, sub coming to subtypes of glaucoma, pigmentary glaucoma, we can try myotics, especially if the patient is able to tolerate, and prostaglandins also can be tried. Angle resin glaucoma, we can try prostaglandin carbon chondritis inhibitors. Pseudo exfoliation glaucoma, especially prostaglandin analogs are found to be best one. Steroid induced, you can try anyone. PSEG, especially pilocarbon before laser pyridotomy. A congenital glaucoma is basically a surgical disease, but one can try medicines especially, and uh, beta blockers not advised. Beta blockers and brimodin we have to avoid as they can create problems in children. The best choice is topical carbon and hydrogen inhibitors. Inflammatory glaucoma avoid pilocarbon and prostaglandins. Carbo carbon and hydrogen inhibitors are the best choice. In lactating and pregnant women especially, as most of the drugs are category C, uncertain safety. And we have to avoid carbonic and hydrogen inhibitors because in the long run they can cause teratoma. Prostaglandins, they can induce a premature labor. Brimodine and uh, beta blockers, we can use up to eight months of pregnancy. After that, they have to be stopped. The best thing in pregnant women is to do a laser selective trabeculoplasty. Are the medical therapy completely safe? In long term, especially if you use the drugs over a period of one to two decades, they can cause conjunctival cicatrization that can ultimately lead to dry eye and also the, so the, although the subsequent surgery will be a failure. Regarding medical legal issues, not warning the patients about side effects of the drugs is the most common cause for uh, medical legal issues and the failure to educate the patient and family also is one of the cause. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Hmm. It was a great talk. I think uh, in seven minutes, it is a marvelous job to finish. It is a 40 the minutes start, madam. I have exactly to condense, so. condense so to. So I think I revised my whole medical management. Thank you so much. Uh, so just uh, I, I, as a student, I wanted to ask you, like uh, uh, in uh, medical management, after uh, using four drugs, 
so how long do you keep on four drugs sir if the patient uh, like what are your indications if so you actually four drugs are indicated when the patient is not fit for surgery madam okay. the, usually the basic definition is once it is not effective but with three drugs indication is surgery only okay, okay four drugs are tried only in situations when the patient is not fit for surgery okay thank you sir thank you so much so uh, next i would like to invite uh, dr manoj chandra mathur sir uh, on who uh, will be speaking on ocular hypertension when to treat welcome sir yeah thank you thank you and good afternoon i shall be speaking about how ocular hypertension when to treat so structural functional correlation forms the cornerstone of diagnosis of glaucoma though iop is not included in the definition of glaucoma it still remains the only modifiable risk factor if we may say so in the treatment of glaucoma it may have a limited value in diagnosis but is very important in prognosis we all know if there is a intraocular pressure over 30 we stand a risk of vascular occlusion so if you see this bell curve here statistically a mean of 16 mm pressure is considered normal two shift of two standard deviations either side gives a range of 10 to 21 as the normal range for intraocular pressure we have to also understand that the field loss may be present even when the iop is in the normal range on the other end of the spectrum there may not be any field loss even in a high iop with a patient with high iop so before we want to see how to whether to treat ocular hypertension or not you must know a little bit about the ocular hypertension treatment study this is a multicentric randomized prospective clinical trial designed to study the effect of topical um, uh, ocular hypertension medication in delaying the onset of glaucoma so what they did is they took uh, included patients with iop of in the range of 24 to 32 with a normal visual field and a normal optic disc so that structurally and functionally the, the patient should be normal but with a high intraocular pressure and they aimed for a 20% lowering and the maintained the value was around less or up to 24 mm of mercury the results of this study the mean iop reduction was 22.5% in the treated group compared to just 4% in the control group after 5 years 4.4% of the treated group converted to glaucoma compared to 9% in the control group this gave a eureka feeling that about there is a 50% risk reduction but what we need to understand that on the corollary now over 90% of the untreated patients did not convert to glaucoma that means if you have observed 100 patients under control only 9 of them progressed whereas have we unnecessarily do is it required to treat the remaining 91% is for us to decide so POAG conversion was more detected on disc photographs about 50% compared to just perimetry in about 40% of the cases so the risk factors of progressions were thin cct so the value of correction of intraocular pressure with the central corneal thickness the value with higher iop if there is a disc hemorrhage you need to suspect some structural defect older age people you have to suspect uh, probably the chances of conversion are more larger cup disc vertical ratio and higher psd on perimetry these were the risk factors that were considered um, early medical treatment does reduce the cumulative incidence of poag however it is not essential to treat all ocular hypertension patients the absolute risk reduction for conversion is greatest in high risk individuals so who are these high risk individuals the conversion to poag continues over the last 15 years follow up with the available data the risk factors of progression were older age thin cct you must treat higher iop above say practice the theoretically they may say 28 to 30 but practically in our clinical setup for me the personal cut off is about 26 to 27 camping with a sharp edges disc hemorrhage larger vertical cup disc ratio and higher psd on perimetry and associated risk factors if the patient has family history frequent change of glasses diabetes hypertension thyroid disorders post surgery or post trauma and long term use of steroids if the intraocular pressure is high optic disc is normal if the, the perimetric changes are not there in with these risk factors if with the presence of these risk factors you can think of treating these ocular hypertensive patients so if you see some cases here the discs were like this the intraocular pressure 26 or 25 cct was in a normal range 
And if you see the OCT, the superior nasal segment was sharp. Unlike in glaucoma, we expect changes in the superior temporal or inferior temporal segments, but here the superior nasal segments were sharp with 26, 27 pressure with some associated risk factor. It is for you to decide whether the, you want to treat the patient or not. If the patient is easily accessible, if the patient is having a regular follow-up with you, probably you can observe, otherwise treat such patients. Now, if you see this, a 49-year-old female with family history of glaucoma, typical the mother had uh, the distinct glaucoma with 27 millimeter pressure, I would like to personally reduce the pressure to about 20-30% and be happy with the normal intra visual fields. And now if you see, when you do an OCT, the RNFL fibers are all normal, but the GCC complex is significant, there is a significant loss. This study shows that when there is a GCC significant loss, a high intraocular pressure is better treated than observed. So if you see this, especially on the disc on the right side, it looks very ominous, it's a very big cup with a very thin inferior temporal segment, you are tempted to treat, but with a better follow-up, with a absolutely normal OCT, over a period of time, absolutely normal fields, I am continuing to observe this patient. So the discretion is yours. Every patient is different. Every ocular hypertension you need not treat, but in, if you, there are associated risk factors, which I have enumerated earlier, in such similar situations, you need to take a clinical judgment whether you need to treat an ocular hypertension or not. Ultimately, this final case I always present whenever I am speaking about the medical management. Just see this case. All parameters okay. These are the optic discs. The visual fields are absolutely normal. When I did the OCT in the right eye, there is a superior temporal and inferior temporal thinning. I went back and at uh, that time, this is my learning curve with OCT. Subsequently, I came to know about the GCC. When I studied, the, the, when I looked back, then I started seeing some sort of a uh, retinal nerve fiber layer drop out here. Then I put the patient on treatment. Subsequently, I learned about the GCC significance. And when I repeated the OCT, where is the STIT segment gone? There is nothing. Go back. Review the case again, the OCT six months apart, superior temporal and inferior temporal segment thinning in the first instance, absolutely normal in the second instance. If you see the decentration, where was the OCT measured? In the first instance, in the April OCT, it is totally decentered. So a peripheral segment was measured and that contributed to the thinning of STIT. So we need to know when to treat, is that defect what you are seeing is an artifact. The man behind the machine is equally important. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Uh, next, uh, we have uh, uh, Ma'am Vani Vanita Patak Ray. She will be, Ma'am will be, will be speaking on uh, primary non-valve glaucoma drainage devices in secondary glaucoma. Welcome, Ma'am. Thank you very much, and I'm grateful and thankful to AIOS for this kind in uh, invitation. Um, why do we need GDDs? But basically because we have a group of glaucomas called refractory who are frequently not controlled with maximum medical therapy, you know, uh, Dimox as well, where surgical management of trabeculectomy, even with MMC, is deemed to be, um, uh, you know, a failure or uh, is anticipated to fail or in those where traps have already failed. So <clears throat> what, why are they refractory in nature? Because they have more risk factors. Generally, they tend to have more inflammation or they tend to have membranes growing over the angle causing severe closure or tend to have conjunctiva that is virgin, that is not virgin and already scarred due to previous surgery or it may be a combination of all of these factors. So why do we need? We need it for neovascular glaucoma, post-VR surgery, post-PK, aphakic, pseudophakic, post-trauma, eye syndrome, uveitic glaucoma, capro, the list is endless, actually. <clears throat> so why choose primary non-valve tube in secondary glaucoma? We all know that, you know, one trap is done, it fails. Second trap is done, it may fail. I know people have done three traps and then the patients have come to me and then their tubes have also failed. So one has to give the best chance to the patient 
because the first chance is the best chance. So tubes tend to have poorer outcomes if multiple traps are done. This is something I think we need to understand at a much deeper level. And valved GDDs, hemoglobin valve is the uptake of it is is is. Um, quite, uh, quite a lot in our country, but non-valve, not many people are doing. They tend to have IOP, which is controlled again with AGM, anti-glaucoma medication. And there is a, uh, a, a talk on uh, ocular surface disease, and more and more use of anti-glaucoma medications is causing ocular surface disease, red, watery, teary eyes, which we are ignoring. These are the causes for failure of any future surgery. So <clears throat> more failure is expected from valve GTDs. The non-valve tubes available in India, you know, from 2013 was the Orolab aqueous drainage implant, which is indigenous, cost-effective. Design inspiration is the Bowell 350 millimeter square. Now we also have another one called Emma Clear Path. Both of these have initial hypotony, which you need to preemptively manage, and the resultant initial hy hypertensive phase prior to suture autolysis should be managed or, or with fenestration, stents, and even orphan traps. So this is, on the left is a bar welt, on the right is Adi, they're pretty similar, 350 millimeter square, because it's a large plate, end plate, you have to put it under the muscle. The Emma Clear Path has two models, 350, which again needs to be put under the muscles, and the 250, which is becoming pretty popular now, is because it can be put in between two muscles. How does it drain? Thin fibrous capsule formation around the plate happens around five to six weeks. You have, you've ligated the tube, please remember that. Ax, this axis is a reservoir. Aqueous pools in the potential space between plate and capsule, and it passively diffuses out, and it's then absorbed by capillaries and lymphatics. Therefore, it is <clears throat> suggested that IOP reduction is dependent on the surface area of capsule formation, which is directly proportional to the end plate size and to the thickness of the capsule. So lower post-operative IOP is expected with a thinner capsule and larger surface area of this thin encapsulation. So let's have a look at uh, some of the, uh, the surgical technique. You basically need to dissect out the um, adjacent recti, then you take the plate, you occlude it, and you use some fenestrating vents anterior to it. You can even use a vicral stent. And <clears throat> before placing the plate uh, under the muscles, or you can use a rip cord. Basically, you reduce the size of the lumen so that when suture autolysis occurs at six weeks, then you do not have a precipitous hypotony, which is what most people are worried about. And you prepare the plate similarly. You occlude it, then you place fenestrations, and then you place it under the muscles. <clears throat> I typically place these 10 millimeters posterior. So the new one, you can see now that the uh, incision is so small, it's only five millimeters, and I'm about four to five millimeters behind the limbus. This is the Ahmed Clear Path 250. Again, the plate is prepared very similarly, and in these, a 4-0 proline uh, rip cord comes pre-placed, so you don't even have to procure it separately. And so you occlude it here. I, uh, the first occlusive ligature did not occlude it completely, so I used another one. And <clears throat> at every point, I check. I check for occlusion, and then I check for uh, filtration anterior to the occlusion. So here you can see, uh, sorry, that you can actually fold the tube. I'll show, you, show it to you again. You can, no, this is the other slide, sorry. How seven minutes disappear, you don't even know. Yeah, so you fold like a taco. You fold the tube. I don't know if you remember doing foldable implants. Initially, they didn't, we didn't have injectors. So you fold and you go through that five millimeter incision and you just let it unfold inside. 
and it's in between muscles. So it's, in spite of it being a very invasive surgery, and it, very fortunately, it is not that invasive. And once you have placed the plate and fixed it, the proce this process is very, the surgical procedure is very similar. I typically place all my tubes, especially in pseudophagic and aphagic eyes, in the ciliary sulcus. The reason being that you, it prevents tube endothelial touch and endothelial cell loss over a period of time. So there are very few studies that have um, been done in India comparing or, uh, you know, uh, based on tubes. But uh, there are RCTs that have done, been done in the West and they have looked at Bowelt versus Emmer glaucoma valve, the valved one. None of the studies have actually done it in primary glaucoma. So I just want to briefly share with you primary, the results of uh, my series of uh, Adi in primary glaucoma. Uh, ACP was reduced, uh, introduced very recently and unfortunately I don't have the follow up yet. So th these are 59 Adis, all are primary tubes in secondary glaucoma. And as you saw, the NVG and the VR surgery group was the highest. Here you can see preoperative uh, pre IOP was 36 and it reduced to 13, a whopping 64% reduction. <coughs> Failure was in about 8.5% 8, 8 and most of it was because of explants. And the explants happened mostly in eyes where conjunctiva was um, very scarred due to VR surgery. Then uh, anti-glaucoma medication started with 3.8 and reduced to 0.9, a 76% reduction in success rate over three years, 92, 90, and 82%. Uh, complications, anything less than 50% in tubes is actually excellent result. And interventions, only about 15%. And there was no incidence of serious complications, no loss of vision. So I will end by saying tubes are indicated in refractory glaucomas where failure of TRAB also is anticipated. More manipulations are required in non-valve GDD to keep IOP under control. And this initial hypotony which is expected should be managed preemptively and only your meticulous technique will, will avoid this. Res resulted initial hypertensive phase should be managed the way I just showed you. So greater understanding of the non-valve technique helps to minimize incidence of safety related adverse events. Like I showed you, complications were not that many. Preempting complications and planning countermeasures lead to optimal outcomes and particular attention needs to be given to the length of the tube and its placement. It's well worth the pain for the gains that you get. Thank you very much. Thank you, ma'am. I think it was a very enlightening talk and we got to know about the most recent devices that are being just started, I would say. So thank you for enlightening April. all of us. April this year we started using it. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you so much. So next I would like to invite uh, Bhagbat Nayak, sir. Um, we'll be speaking on uh, combined surgery, where to choose and how. Respected faculty and their delegates, thanks AIS for the giving the opportunity. So my talk, uh, talk is combined surgery, where to choose and how. After listening to medical management uh, of glaucoma, chlorhypertension and madam's extremely well presentation by uh, tube surgery. So we'll go uh, to now the combined surgery by simple trabeculectomy with cataract surgery, where to do and how. So as you know, uh, simultaneous presence of visually significant cataract and medically uncontrolled glaucoma having advanced glucomatous optic nerve damage or visual field loss. We are uh, prone to uh, tend to go for the combined surgery. A combined approach has the advantages of reduced overall cost, reduced anesthesia and surgery time and less recovery time. Individually patient approach is the most important. The severity of glaucoma must be taken into account for all cases of cataract surgery in a glaucoma patient. In case of a refractive glaucoma when more than three drugs are required, with the associated very early stage of cataract, it is advisable to postpone any, any facomalization procedure until after glaucoma surgery. And also the same time, the cartilaginous effect of the procedure should be considered also because after trabeculectomy, uh, there is a high chance uh, of um, uh, the increased cartilaginesis. 
मोर ओवर कार्टेट एक्सट्रक्शन परफॉर्मड आफ्टर फिल्टरिंग सर्जरी मे लीड टू रिडक्शन ऑफ द ब्लैक फंक्शन ऑल्सो सो दैट्स वाई द प्रॉब्लम इज वेन टू डू द कम्बाइंड सर्जरी एंड वाई टू डू बिकॉज इफ यू आर डूइंग द कार्टेट सर्जरी आफ्टर द टैबलेटमी द ब्लैक फंक्शन मे रिड्यूस्ड सो दैट इज इंडिविजुअल केस अप्रोच इज आई टोल्ड यू सो आई विल शो सम केसेस लाइक दिस इज वन ऑफ माई पेशेंट द पी एस सी जी पेशेंट यू कैन सी दिफ्लेयर ऑफ आटर भी एक्सेट्रा स्विटर आटर भी एंड द अंट्री चेम्बर इज वेरी शेलो द पेसेंट्स हाइस्ट पेसेंट प्रेसर फोर्टी थ्री फोर्टी टू मिलीमीटर मार्क करी वेट रईट ए पॉइंट एट कपिंग एंड वेन पेसेंट कैम्प आफ्टर फोर फोर मंथस द टूडे दैट डे प्रेसर वर्थ थर्टी थ्री थर्टी फोर सो वाई आई आस्ट बिकज पेसेंट हेज स्टॉप्ड ऑल द मेडिकेशन इज फोर डेज बिकज पेसेंट हेज टू कम टू डॉक्टर्स इवन आफ्टर आवर रिपीटेड काउंसिलिंग वेन पेसेंट कम्स फ्रॉम रिमोट प्लेस दे डोट अंडरस्टैंड समटाइम्स द लांग्वेज इवन ड्यू टू आर बिजी शेड्यूल्स बिजी ओपीडी द काउंसिलिंग मे नट भी प्रपर एंड मे बी दैट फाइनेंशियल इश्यू एंड मे बी दैट कंप्लेन्स इश्यू दीज आर द फोर ड्रग्स पेसेंट यूजिंग सो इन दिस केसेस आई एम इफ यू विल डू द कार्टरेट इज ग्रेट टू न्यूक्लियस रिस इफ यू आई थिंक फॉर द कार्टरेट सर्जरी और ट्रैबलिटमी and the uh, thinking about the compliance and the financial issue we may go for combined surgery one eight percent poor compliance last to follow up from remote area uh, her uh, only son is working in a bangalore distance and patient doesn't want second surgery so we may think for this here is one my case a pcg patient after 3 days there is a cd and on 10 days 10th uh, day you can see that cd i uh, got a uh, result but uh, with steroid etc but uh, due to the shallow uh, se the cataract genesis in anterior capsule started and in one month uh, you can see that the visual significant cataract so i thought ki i could i could have been uh, think for the combined surgery in the case because if you do cataract surgery now the vision is very much uh, less here so there is a chance of blade failure here is another case uh, with pseudo explanation with crv with nvg after giving the anti avhf uh, we did the uh, trabeculectomy first so at that time the cataract was not significant and you can see there is a good uh, well uh, sc maintain and uh, but the blev was good also but after one month the cataract genesis uh, enhanced uh, that, that you can see the depth of anterior chamber is less still the blev is working good after three months but you can see there is uh, some anterior subcapsular cataract so these are the uh, some patients you cannot explain now uh, why the so much cataract because there is some inflammation in posterior segment we have given the uh, anti vhf etc there is pseudo explanation okay so in those cases uh, you will if you think retrogately we will think that it we might have gone for the combined surgery because once you do cataract surgery in the cases the chance of blev function is uh, may be reduced so combined surgery today it either with the trabeculectomy with either without mmc what is the gold standard you can go for the tube also now as in some secondary glaucoma and phacomelation with mijs after evolution of uh, minimal invasive glaucoma surgery in mild to moderate cases or in some cases i'll uh, tell now so there are two three approach we can go for combined surgery as you know the hypertensive effect of the cataract surgery alone is by uh, just 2 to 4 mm by uh, variable period 1 to 7 years and phacomelation with the trabeculectomy still the standard treatment of choice till date and the mijs up to 40% reduction of i expected so preferred in mild to moderate cases of glaucoma poeg Uh, pseudo explanation and uh, pigment dispersion syndrome and combined surgery uh, trabeculectomy with mmc with, with or without mmc in moderate to severe glaucoma it basically reduces the peak of iop complication may be more and premium il uh, may even at port because there is advanced glaucoma that is contact issue but in uh, mijs if you are thinking for the mild to moderate cases the where the uh, that means you you are expecting less complications you can uh, want to uh, avoid the topical drugs because the patient have complex issue and the cosmetic issue and you can think for the premium oil also but the thing is that here the familiarization with the technique are required you ha should have the the good microscope with the ang angle uh, changing uh, scope and the surgical gonio uh, lens and su surgical manipulation angle you want to do so some skill is required and there are some publications coming now the rct etc with the eye strength Uh, the number of eye strength you will uh, put the the num the decrease of iop will be there and they are they have they coming uh, they coming with the promising results so i will show you how to do a com simple trabeculectomy with a, uh, that means phacomelification there are uh, multiple uh, options you can go with the same site as in morning session someone uh, described with the same site and different site some uh, different uh, same site is some resentment is like more complication the chances of uh, blade failure is there Patient uh, people are doing with the SICs also, but as I am, a, as I do phacosurgeon, I am a phacosurgeon also. So 
I do always my two sides, like superior trabecular ectomy with a temporal focus, so that there is a minimal, uh, that means uh, uh, complications or minimal inflammations are to the trabecular ectomy or wound healing is good. Here the patient was 70 year female, uh, 100 patient, advanced mixed mechanical glaucoma, vision is sickly cystic, get 2 to 3 nucleosis, and 4 medications and 4 for compliance. So we did for the combined surgery, the superior uh, trap first, as someone told, ki, first you will do the cutter surgery, then you go for trabecular ectomy. But the thing is that if you first do uh, cutter surgery, and without going for the flap raising, so there may be difficulty in uh, flap raising in trabecular ectomy due to uh, hypotonia, etc. So first go for the till the flap without entering the entry chamber, then you can sit the, your position if you are doing the sorry, yeah, temporal FACO. So uh, here is my uh, the flap, you can go either way, like you no. Know, uh, that is limbal based or furnished based, is the furnished based flap, and you have to do the minimal, uh, that, that means uh, tissue damage. I usually put 0.02% mitomycin in simple first uh, time trabeculectomy, if you not secondary glaucoma or repeatability, and uh, quadrangular flap I usually made. And you can lift the flap with either crescent blade or blade breaker with 15 hour blade. So with uh, handling, although I'm holding it seems as uh, speculum, but you can hold with any speculum without damaging the flap. Flap should be not be uh, thick or thin, as you know. And without, uh, without entering the anterior chamber, I changed my position to the temporal, uh, that means side, for a uh, FECO. And here the, there is mixed mechanical glaucoma, the anterior chamber are not so shallow, but also not good depth. So uh, in, this, in this procedure, so we have to uh, think for the wound site, that means the desmond detachment like in the uh, bent needle. Uh, sorry, the system side, and uh, so a clear corneal FECO you want to prefer because you don't want any uh, that means uh, inflammations on the conjunctiva or second trap may require, and uh, there may be some uh, in if you are doing in PACG patient there may be some other uh, complications like uh, anterior chamber uh, shallowing etc. You have to good you have to do uh, put some good. Uh, I would like you to conclude since your time is sorry? up. Sorry, I would like you to con conclude since your time is up. Sorry? Time, time oh, is time out. Time is out? Yes. Okay, okay. Uh, so, uh, first, I am doing first. So, after putting the lens, uh, you, you will, uh, sorry. And you will put uh, two uh, corner suture and uh, I put then one religible you can put in combined surgery because hypotony may be expected. And after the, I put the wing suture with tangerine nylon and mattress suture I put for anterior lip, uh, that is double shaker. And you can see that there is a good uh, blade forming, okay, with finishing and the surgery. So there are some helping tools. You can take, uh, you can do ASOC to UVM to know the lens vault, etc. There is a relative lens vault. Uh, you can uh, measure this because nowadays only lens vault or anterior chamber depth is not the point because lens vault is the from the slash floor to slash floor this height to the lens uh, apex and in comparison to anterior vault the relative lens vault it is important you can take out the uh, UVM. So age, severity of glaucoma, types of glaucoma, degree of cut rate and what are the highest patient IOP, number of medication patient is on, patient compliance and obviously lot of surgeons competency and comfort is should uh, taken in account into the combined surgery. Thank you for your kind attention. Thank you, Mr. Naik. It was a great talk. So, um, I I wanted to know that uh, in okay, we'll take the discussions, discussions later. later on. We'll finish the talks first. So we so invite the next speaker, Dr. Anand Naik. I just request to please stick to your time because if we overshoot, we are taking somebody else's time and the sessions run late. We don't want the sessions to be late. Uh, one real debate in uh, today's era that uh, MIG should be done on nasally or temporally. So after aqueous angiography, uh, 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 this gives the best answer that uh, where to put uh, minimally invasive glaucoma surgeries. So coming to principle, it's a uh, real-time aqueous uh, outflow mechanism which uses uh, confocal scanning laser ophthalmoscopy uh, using spectralis uh, me mechanism with flex camera. So uh, aqueous angiography can be done with uh, two dyes, one is 0.5 percent endocyanin uh, green, uh, green dye or you can reduce the concentration also but uh, we tried uh, most of the 
0.1 percent endocyanin in green, so there is no uh, decrease in quality of the image also. And then 2 percent fluorescein angiography uh, can be done with uh, uh, very good image quality also, but uh, with fluorescein there are some side effects like uh, uh, severe staining and toxicity of the corneal endothelium and uh, epithelium, uh, lens severe staining of the capsule and vitreous. Uh, with endocyanin green, there are minimal uh, side effects like uh, staining of the corneal epithelium and endothelium, uh, and there is uh, staining of the trabecular meshwork, posterior trabecular meshwork. So dye preparation in uh, aro green, uh, there is the solvent given by the company. Uh, you you just has to inject uh, in the solvent. Excuse me, Anand, what is your topic? Actually, outcomes in moderate to severe glaucoma, uh, but uh, a little bang, bit of bang. Uh, of bang. Yeah. So I am uh, further going forward. So I will come out. So it's actually there is slight change in title also. So I used aqueous angiography a bit uh, to explain a uh, procedure uh, little uh, higher uh, level. So after uh, this the uh, flex camera, uh, flex velocity we use for capturing uh, after goniectomy to see where the channels are and where to uh, use uh, minimally invasive glaucoma surgery. And uh, after injecting the dye, you have to focus the uh, camera uh, at the depth of 23 to 30 diopters of uh, depth using 30 or 55 degree anterior chamber lens. And uh, then uh, uh, tight anterior chamber maintenance is very important. So uh, this is the one small surgical clip showing after injecting the uh, endocyanin in green dye. So we notify that uh, aqueous channels are dense network of aqueous channels are more in the nasal quadrant and then uh, superior, inferior quadrant and uh, minimal at the temporal quadrant. So uh, there is segmental, uh, segmental aqueous outflow is noted, uh, that is actually maximum in the nasal quadrant and uh, little to uh, very low at the temporal quadrant. So this is the one uh, paper we published at uh, British Medi Medical Journal that uh, actionated outflow is noted after goniectomy in the uh, high uh, maximal aqueous outflow area. Uh, with minimal tissue damage and enha enhances the IOP lo lowering efficacy. So this is the one of the uh, patient of uh, primary open angle glaucoma uh, with advanced glaucomatous optic neuropathy. So we did uh, initially uh, aqueous angiography with endocyanin in green. So uh, then we noted maximum channels at the nasal quadrant and then uh, um, superior and inferior quadrant and nil uh, channels at the temporal quadrant. And then we performed uh, minimally invasive glaucoma surgery in, in this advanced patient, advanced glaucomatous optic neuropathy patient in the low flow area, that is temporal quadrant. Of, uh, sorry, and uh, after that, uh, after that meek surgery, uh, see here uh, bang is performed one minute, video is stuck, so uh, I am go going to next one, next slide please, can I restart? Second one. So here we performed goniectomy in the temporal quadrant and later uh, there is, uh, at the goniectomy area two uh, new aqueous outflow channels are opened up in, in this advanced glaucoma patient. So uh, uh, performing uh, temporal versus nasal, according to surgeon's convenience we usu usually do minimally invasive glaucoma surgeries at nasal quadrant in, uh, in view of surgeon's access but temporal, uh, temporally doing uh, these surgeries are uh, greater efficacy with lower greater lowering of uh, intraocular pressure. So this is the one uh, aqueous angiography performed in uh, IMSC, only cataract patient, no glaucoma. So there is 360 degree uh, high flow of uh, aqueous is noted, uh, aqueous outflow channels are noted. And then uh, this is one normal tension glaucoma patient with uh, uh, around IOP of 40, 12 to 14 mm of HG, the 360 degree uh, dense network of aqueous channels are noted in uh, all these patients. So NTG explains that uh, actually aqueous outflow obstruction is not there in the NTG patients. And then uh, it's again stuck.
बड़ी उजल बार बार क्यों हो रहा है ये So this this is the one uh, primary angle closure glaucoma with advanced glaucomatous optic neuropathy after ICG uh, angiography. So no aqueous channels are noted at uh, uh, from around one to two minutes uh, difference time. And uh, see you can after injection of the dye there are no aqueous channels noted at prominent uh, maximum time also. So there are post-operative observations that in any uh, moderate to severe glaucoma patients, you can do minimally invasive glaucoma surgery, but aqueous angiography gives ideal to that way to put minimally invasive uh, uh, stents or uh, do goniectomy also. So these are the some post-operative observations that with uh, fluorescein dye, there are severe staining of the corneal epithelium and endothelium and lens capsule staining. Uh, on uh, ICG staining, there will be uh, staining of the trabecular meshwork and uh, angle chum, uh, ch uh, chum, ang uh, anterior chamber angle structures. So, with uh, there will be uh, haze, media haze also while performing surgery. So, better to avoid uh, fluorescein dye and use endocenin green dye uh, with lower concentrations. Thank you. I would next uh, like to invite uh, Dr. Shivani, who will be speaking on ocular surface disease and glaucoma medications. Good afternoon everyone, I am Dr. Shivani. So I will be presenting on ocular surface disease and glaucoma medications. So the objectives of my presentation are to discuss the clinical features of drug-induced pseudofemphicoid and discuss the management of glaucoma in this case. So usually uh, such patients usually come to our uh, OPD with the chief complaints of redness, watering and photophobia. Uh, each, uh, even in few cases there could be like itching, pain, blurring of vision and foreign body sensations but it is usually localized to the eye. Uh, in which the patient is using medications. So coming to the history, generally these patients will be treated elsewhere as chronic follicular conjunctivitis with no relief of symptoms. Uh, in this also we can see uh, only in the particular eye in which the AGMs were taken. So in the history we need to go, go back and ask the patients whether the patient is using on any anti-glaucoma medications or not. So now uh, I want to discuss like how these anti-glaucoma medications act on the conjunctiva. So the mechanism by which this conjunctiva can react to these medications are like it can form cicatrizational conjunctivitis or any anaphylide reaction which is type 1 hypersensitivity reactions or any allergic contact dermatoconjunctivitis which is type 4 hypersensitivity reactions or it can form any non-specific irritative or toxic conjunctivitis. So the potential factors for these adverse effects on the conjunctiva are due to the uh, type of medications what the patient is using or due to the preservatives in which uh, due to the preservatives or number of medications and duration of the therapy and frequency of these medications or physiological properties of these drugs. The spectrum of this conjunctiva reaction can vary from total tolerance to severe clinical disease. So the uh, this cl uh, various clinical presentations include like uh, in the skin it could be like skin excoriation lichenification in the lids it can present as entropy and punctal stenosis or keratinization in the conjunctiva there could be follicular reaction fibrosis phonicial shortening and simplephron in the cornea there could be superficial punctate keratitis ulcers or opacification with vascularization and in the lens it could form cataractus and in the retina it can even cause cystoid macular edema so there are a few photographs of these presentations, like in the skin, whenever these AGMs come in contact with our skin directly, it can form skin excoriation and it thickens to form this like this lichenifications and in the lids it can form lid thickening, entropions due to this fibrosis and punctal stenosis, keratinization of the lid margins, hyperemia of the conjunctiva, follicular reactions, uh, here the follicular reaction is usually seen in the lower tarsal conjunctiva than in the upper and this subconjunctiva fibrosis, phonicial shortenings, simplephron formations, medial canthal keratinizations along with ankylobriferons, superficial punctate keratitis, panis formation, and at the last sterile corneal melt, and even sometimes it can form into opacification with vascularizations. 
So all these come under the category of drug-induced pseudofempigoid. So what is drug-induced pseudofempigoid? So it is a clinical finding which is identical to mucous membrane pempigoid, which occurs usually in response to varying offending topical and systemic drugs. But in uh, drug-induced pseudofempigoid, there will be absence of any systemic uh, features which are present in MMP, and it differs from MMP like it is usually unilateral, and the symptoms are localized to the eyes uh, in which the patient is using AGMs, and it is non-progressive in nature, whereas MMP it is progressive in nature in spite of cessation of the drugs. So the criteria for pseudofempigoid is it can uh, it is a chronic cicatricial conjunctivitis along with the history of. Uh, absence of alternate cause of cicatrization and biopsy we need to rule out MMP. So what could be the differential diagnosis for this? So it is pseudomembranous conjunctivitis. As I already told, uh, these patients will be treated elsewhere as conjunctivitis for a longer period of time. Uh, and in the main differentiating feature is in this conjunctivitis, both upper and lower tonsil conjunctiva will be more or less equally affected. But whereas this here, more often lower tonsil conjunctiva will be affected. And the it can also present one of the differential is trachoma sequelae where upper tarsal conjunctiva will be affected with pans formation and lead anomalies. And the other one is ocular cicatrational pemphigoid where it is progressive and systemic involvement can be there. Coming to the management, the aim of treatment is, only, uh, is not only to treat ocular surface management but also to control intraocular pressure. So to control intraocular pressure when in the state of uh, cicatrization, when it is early, we can either do trabeculectomy or implant when the conjunctiva is healthy. But when it is in advanced cases, we need to switch to preservative-free alternative drugs and reassess intraocular pressures. If the intraocular pressures is well controlled, we can continue anti-glaucoma medications. But if the pressures are not under control, even with preservative-free medications, we need to go for conjunctival sparing surgeries like cytophotocoagulations or uh, laser trabeculoplasties or MIGs. <coughs> So coming to the surface management algorithm, uh, we need to control the surface inflammation by giving topical steroids or immunosuppressants. And to improve vision, we need to give intense lubricants, glasses, or scleral contact lens. And we can even go ahead fed with the character processes. To address the progression, either we need to withdraw or replace the medications which the patient is on. Coming to the prognosis, uh, persistence of ocular lesions without progression is seen in 43% of the cases. And the recurrence is seen in 8% of the people. So my take home message is underdiagnosed, mm -hmm. underdiagnosed in its early stages due to failure of recognition. So high, high index of suspicion and a greater awareness of this condition is essential to identify the predisposed individuals early in the disease process and treat appropriately. Suspect AGM toxicity in case of non-resolving chronic follicular conjunctivitis and drug history and careful clinical evaluation helps in diagnosis. Stop the offending drug is mandatory and appreciating cicatricial changes as a complication of glaucoma therapy and actively looking for it in each glaucoma patient at every clinical visit will be simple rapid screening measure. Thank you. Thank you, Shivani. So next we have uh, Dr. Anindya Anuradha who will be speaking on need for emergence of pediatric glaucoma surgeons a review. Dr. Anindya is not there. Okay, then we will take the last talk by you, Dr. Deepthi. Until she's connecting a laptop, I just wanted to ask you, you mentioned that the lymphatics are more in the nasal quadrant. Uh, that's why we are doing the procedure more on the nasal side. So, Actually, uh, the aqueous channel, dense network of aqueous channels on nasal quadrant, that is uh, universally accepted and mm -hmm. that's what the aqueous angiography is also showing. But the thing is, uh, uh, you, uh, actually we put minimally invasive glaucoma surgeries, whatever stents we are putting, uh, gonectomy we are doing, yeah, GAT we are doing, uh, that's actually based on surgeon's access. We sit on the temporal side, we do surgery on the nasal side. So no, but the logic is, uh, we are the, performing the position on the nasal side because the lymphatics are more on that side. More on the that side, that is not the logic. That's what we blindly are doing in so view of When you are doing on the nasal side, the lymphatics will open up. And no, because no. the density Already is more? Lymphatics are higher, 
that's why the aqueous is go more outflow on the nasal side yeah so but the, the lymphatics are lesser uh, which are closed on the temporal side we performing surgeries and we have to perform surgeries and stents on the temporal side that's where the whatever the lymphatics which are closed and which are present previously which are closed because of uh, trabecular mesophagic obstruction that will be opened i think dr tanuj had presented this in apgs yeah. and he also had mentioned that the lymphatics are more on the nasal side so if you do a procedure on the nasal side that lymphatics open up and because the density is very high that side so we should do a nasal side uh, mixed procedure no, temporal side the, the lymphatics are less dr vinitha what is your you are there uh, dr uh, deepthi we'll just take one minute we have yes. time so we'll just take this question because very important can you come to the mic please and it's extremely difficult but the thing is actually when you uh, disturb the natu uh, natural uh, the nature of the dense network of channels if you disturb with goniectomy or stent there will be fibrosis that's how the human nature uh, is like if you injure any natural human tissue it heals by fibrosis if you disturb that uh, dense network of channels area it heals by fibrosis and some later, more, some more, I, I have still not convinced because i read the article and i heard dr tanush okay it's okay we'll go to i'll go through it once again and you also go through it once again and we'll, we'll come back to it later yeah, sure. so uh, dr deepthi you are ready yes It's a very interesting topic Dr. Deepthi is going to talk on. She's going to talk on congenital glaucoma management for beginners. Uh, Dr. Anand is left. Actually, his topic was long-term outcomes. I was waiting for the out to listen to the outcomes. Because we have very less studies uh, published in the literature about the bang uh, procedures. So I was thinking there will be some outcomes which uh, his results will be uh, showing it off. still have some time still she is setting it up if you have any questions to any of the speakers pardon unka sir aapka nahi hua ho gaya na
Please all, most of them are glaucoma practitioners. How many of them are glaucoma practitioners? Can you raise a hand so we can have some discussion? Okay, uh, three or four. Yeah, we have three and four. So you all are performing the mixed procedure. I know Dr. Vinita is doing. What about others? I haven't started yet. Okay, what about you? Behind? Yeah. No mixed procedures? So, a lot of talks are going on the mixed procedure. It's very easy to perform if you learn it in the proper way and very gratifying results. Uh, we have extended the indications for mixed procedure beyond mild to moderate glaucoma now. Yeah, the, w the one point I wanted to make, um, Shivani presented very well and unfortunately she has left the hall. But um, uh, ocular surface disease is something that is increasingly being recognized and these situations are best suited for mix. We should be avoiding any surface surgery in these kind of individuals, especially if they are mild to moderate. Um, the lesser number of medications for them, the better. No medications, the best. Best, that's true. Now we'll take up with her talk. She's uh, ready with the talk. Dr. Deepthi. So good afternoon, everybody. Uh, are you able to hear me? So I'm Dr. Deepthi and I'll be presenting on congenital glaucoma management for the beginners. The main reason to present this is, uh, I know most of us are apprehensive to do a case of congenital glaucoma, but it is very important because the prevalence is quite high. So the incidence in Western countries in, is 1 in 10,000 and uh, uh, in the combined states of Andhra Pradesh and Telangana, it is 1 in 3,300. Can and we have the timer please? The involvement is usually bilateral um, and uh, it accounts for 4% uh, of childhood blindness. So most of the cases are sporadic with uh, 10 to 40 percent being familial and autosomal recessive pattern with CYP1B1 gene involvement which is uh, involved in the metabolism of an uh, endogenous substrate required for normal trabecular meshwork development. So classification is congenital where the symptoms are at or before birth up to the age of three months, infantile from three months to three years and juvenile from three years to teenagers and developmental pattern, primary developmental and secondary developmental. Secondary developmental being uh, uh, it, uh, occur, the trabecular meshwork damage occurring uh, due to maldevelopment of some other portion of the eye uh, as occurs in the pupillary block uh, eyes with the microspherophakia and dislocated lens. So this is the childhood glaucoma research uh, network where they have divided both primary congenital glaucoma, juvenile open angle uh, and the acquired uh, no, non-acquired systemic and uh, ocular uh, anomalies as well. So we will be mainly concentrating on the primary congenital glaucoma. So the triad of epiphora, photophobia and blepharospasm, uh, the classical triad uh, where the, intra, the raised intraocular pressure causes corneal epithelial edema initially, causing irritation of the trigeminal nerve, causing photophobia and blepharospasm. Increased uh, IOP also causes globe distension as the sclera and collagen are still pliable. Uh, re leading to megalocornea and bufthalmus. So the corneal enlargement occurs uh, up to the age of 3 years, but the sclera can be deformable until the age of approximately 10 years. So pre-existing megalocornea with elevated IOP, further elevated IOP can cause a break in Desmond's membrane, causing gain into the stroma and aqueous um, and uh, corneal hydrops. So this is a 3-month-old child who presented to me with uh, history of uh, uh, whitening of the black portion of the eye from the past two weeks. Um, so this, uh, uh, the other of, uh, clinical features include haps triae. So they are typically horizontal and linear where they occur centrally and they are parallel and curvilinear when they are in the periphery. So the haps triae are formed when the new desmond membrane is uh, laid down um, due to the uh, curled edges where uh, they entrap the keratocytes uh, stimulating proliferation. So optic disc cupping, uh, the cupping is rapid and occurs in infants. It tends to enlarge circumferentially with glaucoma progression and it is uh, reversible with normalization of the intraocular pressure. So the, uh, there is a minimal uh, laminar uh, connective tissue and uh, there is no immediate loss of axons and uh, it is reversible. So the mimickers of uh, primary congenital glaucoma, megalocornea, 
So the uh, diameter can be more than uh, 30 millimeters of mercury, but uh, the increase in anterior chamber only occurs with a normal vitreous chamber, uh, along with the IOP is generally normal and the disc is healthy. Coming to birth trauma, they, these uh, the hapstra are generally vertical or oblique, and the disc is healthy and IOP is normal. Conservative management in CHED, uh, the corneal uh, di diameter is normal, hapstra are absent, corneal thickness is uh, very thick. And axial length is normal and IOP is also usually normal and if high it is due to the corne increased corneal thickness. So examination under anesthesia very important. Check the IOP before any contact procedure 3 to 5 minutes after the intubation as the adrenergic stimulation caused by intubation can persist for 3 to 5 minutes. So um, anesthetic agents like ketamine and succinylcholine increase the intraocular pressure and uh, mild decrease occurs with midazolam and sevoflurane. Uh, so gonioscopy evaluation of the, uh, the uh, angle is uh, very essential for the diagnosis of the developmental glaucomas. This can be done with a copious lens or it can also be done with a four, mi four mirror gonio lens. So in this picture you can see I have taken picture with the four mirror gonio lens where you can see both the disc cupping as well as the angle structures. Examination of the anterior segment is very important. Why I am stressing is it is not just about the surgery but everything needs to be evaluated before you go in into a surgery. So corneal examination, anterior chamber, iris details and lens details have to be noted. Posterior segment examination, indirect ophthalmoscopy and uh, uh, a cup disc ratio of more than 0.3 and uh, more than 0.5 in older children is significant. Asymmetric cupping is also significant and A scan has to be done and a B scan. Uh, if uh, the cornea is uh, grade 3 to grade 4 where you cannot examine the disc um, or the posterior segment, it is essential to do a B scan to rule out any other posterior segment pathologies. Uh, UBM also has to be done. Uh, so these are the following features. There, there can be thinner iris, larger anterior chamber angle, larger zondular length and thinner serially body. Corneal assessment, uh, the horizontal corneal diameter more than uh, 11, meter, uh, uh, 11 millimeters at newborn is significant. Pachymetry, megalocornea, uh, the pack is normal. Uh, in Bufthalmus, it is less, and CHED, the pachymetry is increased. Refraction is essential uh, to, lo uh, to look into the refra refractive error and also the estimatic change due to the hapstray. Medical management, temporary control of IOP while waiting for surgery in congenital glaucoma, beta blockers, and carbonate anhydrase inhibitors can be given with caution, along with oral dimox, 15 millimeters per kg body weight. And uh, it is a, uh, surgery is the definitive management in congenital glaucoma. Surgical options are at as follows. So in goniotomy, uh, with the help of a 20, um, after placing a direct gonio lens, a 24 gauze needle uh, attached to a 2cc syringe is placed. Uh, in interest of time, I would like to go into uh, combined uh, trabeculotomy and trabeculectomy. So this is a th this is the three month old child who presented to me with enlarged cornea and uh, haze in the right eye. So sorry for that. So for the surgery per se, uh, uh, limbal based, uh, forneal, uh, fornix based conjunctival incision was made, uh, sorry, limbal based incision and uh, uh, the conjunctiva is uh, dis dissected with great precision. It is very important because this is, this, uh, the child has a long way to go and might require several surgeries. So after careful dissection of the conjunctiva coming to the tenons, tenons is generally very thick in them. And the texture of the tissue is quite different in these patients. Later, uh, a careful conjunctival cautery is done and a scleral flap of uh, 3 into 3 millimeters, uh, half thickness to one third thickness is made and the scleral, um, uh, the flap is raised, uh, triangular flap. And once the flap is raised, a pre-placed pre uh, a suture has been placed to the flap and an incision is made uh, at the junction of the grey zone and the white zone and uh, you can see that the flu is in, fluid is egressing and a small bleed is seen. It indicates that we are within the Schlem's canal. Then uh, a tra uh, trabecular tome is uh, inserted and uh, it is uh, inserted into the uh, uh, anterior chamber, likewise on the other side. So around 100 to 120 degrees of uh, trabeculotomy is performed. Later, a scleral uh, 
block is dissected and after the scleral block, uh, peripheral bridectomy is done and the uh, triangular uh, scleral flap is closed with one uh, tensile nylon suture and the conjunctiva is closed with con continuous, in, uh, continuous uh, suture 80 vicryl. So this is the baby one month post-op mm -hmm. and three months post-op. You can see that the corneal haze is reduced just with a small corneal haze. So uh, it is the management starts here actually. So the corneal scar, you have to do a midriasis, surgical idectomy or keratoplasty. For refractive error, myopia, astigmatism, you have to give prescribed glasses and for amblyopia, glasses and patching has to be done. So emotional and financial rehabilitation is very important for the uh, family as well. Uh, it ne requires a life lifelong follow-up, family screening and genetic counselling. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Deepthi. Uh, with this, we conclude our session. Uh, I invite all the speakers who are presented to come for a group photograph. Then we hand over the hall to the next session.